So I want to share with you, I'll, I'll talk about technology. I have a few slides on technology since that's our, our focus. Um, there's a great bit of technology involved in the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series. So that's the hot part, and it is about time. This is a 30 plus year time series that has been studying upper ocean biogeochemistry and ecology uh, in our home waters just north of the island of Oahu. And I really am just the emissary. I'm one of um, what they're called a, a principal investigator. I'm one of the um, lead researchers on this program. I'm taking over from, uh, I affectionately call him my science grandfather. My advisor's advisor, Dave Carl, uh, led this program. He began it in 1988 with Roger Lucas, and I'm taking over as PI in August. So as emissary, I am truly representing a group of 20 plus scientists that go to sea monthly and have, in some instances, uh, over 200 times on these crews. And in one instance, I'll come back to in 100 times in a row. Um, so I'll, I'll hopefully uh, impress upon you how important this, this research is at Station Aloha as a real gathering place for discovery, scientific discovery, for education and collaboration, and importantly, for understanding how our open ocean ecosystems function. And I'll start importantly with a mahalo to David Carl and Roger Lucas. These were the two individuals who founded this program in the 80s. And it was quite visionary then as it is now to imagine that they would begin a time series carefully measuring um, very difficult to measure parameters of the open ocean. Also to a, a very dedicated team of scientists. Again, I said, you know, Every single month, 20 plus individuals go to sea for four or five days, often in inclement weather, um, and are quite dedicated to collecting, analyzing, and interpreting the data that I'm going to show you today. Um, as well as past and present collaborators, this is a Hawaii centric program, but we have collaborators join us from all over the United States as well as international, including volunteers, teachers, educators, and researchers of a whole range of of elements. And I also would just sort of mention that science on this scale is definitively a team sport. These things cannot be done in isolation. I always like to start with this, um, a sense of place, right? Our, our home in the Grand Pacific, um, because at least for me, I'm mesmerized every time I look at these satellite images and curious as to why it's called Earth when it's so obviously ocean, right? And we are here in the middle of this grandest open ocean basin, the Pacific. And this is really the mission of the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series, is to collect data carefully over time to characterize how these systems function and how they potentially might be changing. So looking down into the Pacific, there are distinct regions or habitats the oligotrophic, so low nutrient, North Pacific subtropical gyre is the body of water that characterizes the ocean surrounding. This is akin to the deserts on land. If the North gyre. gyre is this, I'm not supposed to walk outside of my cone. Um, let's see here, let's see if I can do this. There we go. So the circulation of the water in the North Pacific is moving along the equator. Then it hits Japan, moves north with the Kuroshio current, then gets driven by the topography offshore, and then across the subpoles, moves again to the east, and then down western margin of the continental United States. And that circular motion is a gyre. Oh, thank you. So when we look at these systems, we say, here's our subtropical gyre. And then above us, the subpolar gyre goes in the opposite direction. So those currents really enclose this body of water. And in some sense, it's isolated. So the deep ocean, there's an article not too long ago that showed that there's areas in the Pacific and the deep ocean that haven't seen the atmosphere since the Little Ice Age, right? So these are ancient, isolated bodies of water. And this sort of bright blue, so this is a false color image where what we've done is we've taken satellite measurements of chlorophyll, so in indices of plankton biomass, 
and the, the light blue means there's very little. As you get sort of greener and yellow and red, there's quite a bit more chlorophyll biomass. So it's the same as if you're standing on the west coast of the United States and you look at the water, it's green or brown, right? It has a very different color than the water off of Hawaii. And the reason our water is so blue is because there are so few organisms that live in that water, right? So this ancient, huge desert is really the largest continuous ecosystem on our planet. Now we can kind of drill down moving from that massive Pacific to this big desert in the Pacific to this tiny station. This is roughly 100 nautical miles to the north of us. It's a watch circle. So in October of 1988, the time series was begun. It was named a long-term oligotrophic habitat assessment, um, Aloha, which is appropriate name. Okay, what, is that? what is oligotroph? Low nutrient. What? Low nutrients. Low, Low nutrients. Oh. Yeah, so not a lot of nitrogen or phosphorus or any of the, the sort of elements that plants need to grow. So really bad garden, right? Oh. Oligotrophic, right? Oh. Mesotrophic, or if you've heard the word eutrophic, so those are high nutrient levels, right? So what you'd see in a coastal environment or a polluted lake. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. And yes, if anyone has questions as we go along, just, just ask me. Go for it. Yeah. Why are we in a low nutrient area? We're in a low nutrient area because that gyre, right, is sort of isolating this water mass from the sources of nutrients. We're far from land. So phosphate is delivered to the ocean by weathering of rocks. We're far from land and those inputs. Nitrogen is delivered to the ocean primarily by fertilizers, some atmospheric deposition, and various other land sources. So because we're so isolated and far from the sources, the only real sources of nutrients are deep in the water column, right? So in the, in the west coast, those nutrients make it to the surface because the winds favor upwelling. Mm -hmm. So those waters are upwelled into the surface. Here we have no such wind-driven circulation. So you have this permanent sort of um, eternal summer, right? These very stratified, perpetually blue waters with very low seasonality. Mm -hmm. um, I was told that when Dave first uh, came up with it, he was going to call it uh, a long-term habitat assessment experiment. So it would be hot sex. Uh, <laughs> I guess that didn't fly with the funding agency. Or it could have been a tall tale, who knows. Okay, so this is the hot, it's about time. And this is just a little cartoon of, of some of the images of the science that's done at this station. So we have these moorings, these sort of permanent uh, features that are out there that are collecting atmospheric data. Um, again, when the ships go out every month, there are experiments that we run, um, instruments that we deploy over the side of the boat, all of which you're seeing in these three images and the images on the bottom. These are approximately monthly cruises since 1988. Um, there's more than 50 core measurements. And by core measurements, that means a measurement that we collect every single time we go out there. Um, those measurements span chemistry, so looking at nutrient levels, uh, physics, so measuring currents, temperature, salinity, the saltiness of the water, um, biological measurements, looking at the diversity of organisms, the abundance of photosynthetic organisms, the abundance of organisms that eat those organisms, and they really allow a more integrated vision of the microbial community. So we want to understand how these systems work, uh, what they need to survive, and how they're changing. And you can always, since this is recorded, there's this website here in the bottom. If you go to it, you'll find all of our data. It's freely accessible. Um, there's a lot of images of the research that we do, and there's a lot of descriptions of the history and some of the major findings that have been made by this program. How do you select those names? Hahana. SOAST is the department, so uh, Ocean Earth Science and Technology, the school of. And then Hahana, it has a, uh, just people know the Hawaiian words here. It, it's. I know Hawaiian, but I want to, what is Hahana? I'm asking. Hana, yeah. Hana is to work. Yeah. Okay, to work. Hana is breath. To work, yeah. Well, all right, we're working in the ocean.
All right, so this is the queue for video time. It, it didn't embed, so we're going to have to go outside to get there. And I'm sharing this not because you know I don't want to have slides and lectures, but I, there, there are elements of being at sea that you really just can't, I can't tell you, right? So I want to show you some video, and, and I'll preface this with we now have 300 plus cruises. The 310th cruise has just occurred. And this was a video that was made to celebrate 250. On the morning of October 29th, 1988, the University of Hawaii's research vessel, Moana Wave, set sail, embarking on the very first oceanographic research expedition of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series Program, often referred to by its acronym, HOT. This program was developed by researchers in the newly created School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology. Roger Lucas and David Carl, professors in the Department of Oceanography, spearheaded this effort and led the first expedition to Station Aloha. Located 60 nautical miles to the north of the island of Oahu, Hawaii, Station Aloha lies in the open ocean in the largest ecosystem on the planet, the North Pacific Subtropical Giant. The primary objective of the HOT program was to obtain a long-term time series to provide a comprehensive description of the physical and biogeochemical parameters of the ocean at a location characteristic of the gyre. Fast forward nearly 25 years. On the morning of March 9, 2013, the University of Hawaii's research ship, Kila Moana, returned to Honolulu Harbor after successfully completing the 250th research expedition of the HOT program. This expedition marks a major milestone for Earth science and puts Hawaii on the map as one of the only places in the world where we have a decadal scale record of how the ocean is responding to climate change. When Roger Lucas and I started this program in 1988, we thought it might go on for five years, perhaps 10 years if we're lucky. Here we are 25 years and counting. One of the things I can say with a great deal of confidence is that the ocean has never been oversampled and not even at the Station Aloha. Um, however, uh, because of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series project, uh, Station Aloha is probably the best sampled place in the world. We've now completed 250 cruises to our field site, Station Aloha, and we now know more about the Central Pacific than almost anywhere else in the world's oceans. The ocean dominates Earth covering over 70% of the surface of our planet. Yet we still have much to learn about the essential roles of the ocean, the effects of human pressures on this delicate ecosystem, and the potential consequences for life. For the past 25 years, the HOT program has visited Station Aloha approximately every month to observe and interpret habitat variability and to track climate impacts on the wide use of marine ecosystem. During this time, Scientists have consistently been making repeat measurements of at least 40 different ocean parameters. So we know the ocean is an integral part of the Earth's climate system. And one of the things that we've learned in large part through the efforts of the Hawaii Ocean Time Series program is that the ocean is changing and it's changing rapidly. Observing the ocean carefully, consistently, uh, frequently enough, and over a long enough period of time uh, is incredibly hard work. And it's an effort that once in a while pays off with some fundamental discovery. It is well known that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere are rapidly rising. Since 1958, a continuous record of this increase has been documented at the Mount Maloa Observatory on the Big Island of Hawaii. Coincidentally, one of the parameters the HOT program has measured since 1988 is the oceanic carbon dioxide levels. This oceanic data record is one of only two of its kind in the entire world. So analogous to what we've learned about CO2 increasing in the atmosphere, we've also learned CO2 is increasing at almost the same rate in the ocean. And in large part, our understanding of that is based on observations as part of the wide ocean time series. The success of the HOT program to date is a result of the coordinated, dedicated efforts of a large team of academic scientists, marine technicians and engineers, and the professional crews of the research vessels. The hot cruises have um, taken up more than a thousand days at sea over 24 years, and uh, this represents an incredible amount of value. This cruise was very successful, especially because we have very good weather 
and also because the science participants are very, are very professional and have been in the project for a long time. They have a lot of experience. Also, the captain of the Kilmoana and the crew members have helped us a lot in conducting our operations successfully. In addition to its primary mission of ocean research, the HUT program has been an invaluable training ground for undergraduate and graduate students, postdocs, and young faculty members. It's amazing to believe that uh, the HUT has just finished its 250th cruise. We started a generation ago, and now our students are principal investigators on the program. Even after completing 250 research expeditions to Station Aloha, a lot remains to be learned. As the next generation of scientists take lead roles in the program, the challenge is still great. Improve our understanding of the ocean's sensitivity to global climate change. So I hope that gives you a flavor of the um, what this program has accomplished, but the incredible amount of work that it's it's taken to get to this point where we're able to um, start to understand how these systems work, and also a, a little bit of images of what it's like to be at sea. It's it's actually a, a really wonderful experience. So I want to talk today about some of the topics that were brought up in this video. And, and first of all, talk about microbial oceanography, um, really a sea of opportunity, and, and introduce you to a few of the most abundant organisms on this planet that we share, and, and then move into the sort of fragility of our planet and, and talk about how this program has informed um, what we know about the human imprint on the oceans. And then I'll end with really the critical role of time series. You don't know it's changing unless you're looking. This is a wonderful quote by Pasteur. It's very true on many levels that the very great is achieved by the very small. And that couldn't be more apt for anything than microbes. Behind those, you'll see little cartoons of microbes but I'll show you a few more. So some key concepts in microbial oceanography is that marine microorganisms are small, they're abundant, and they're ubiquitous. They're ancient, they have enormous genomic potential, and their metabolism keeps our planet habitable. They produce oxygen and consume CO2 and are the base of the food web that supports many of the fish that we eat in our daily diets. And understanding how they work in the ocean has led to some fundamentally new discoveries about microbial life in the sea. And the image on the bottom is this symbiosis of a specific type of radiolarian. Um, and I always think it's beautiful to look at that and to think about the first people who looked under microscopes. What did they think? How did they know it was a plant or an animal or that it moved or that it ate things. I mean, these are bizarre and beautiful creatures. We'll start with Prochlorococcus. So each of these little green circles is about, it's hard to see the white line here, but that's the diameter of one of those cells. So less than one micron in diameter, that's a millionth of a meter. Right? They're incredibly small and incredibly abundant. We see about, in open ocean settings, more than 100,000 of these wee little beasties per milliliter of seawater. They are estimated to account for about 5%, this one genus, 5% of the total photosynthesis, production of oxygen, consumption of CO2 on our global planet. And they are incredibly abundant. If you add up their mass over the global ocean, it's equivalent to a few hundred million Volkswagen bugs, just to stick with the 70s analogies. And their genomic potential, this is the ancient part, they're uh, millions of years older than humans on this planet. Um, if you account for all of their different species, they have about 80,000 different genes used to build proteins and conduct their own metabolism which is about four times the size of the human genome. So they are clearly better adapted for life on this planet than we are. 
This is data that has been collected from 1988 to 2016 over you know, 287 cruises. And what you're seeing on this axis is depth from the surface ocean to 200 meters uh, deep in the water column. And on the x-axis is the abundant of the little green beasties. So here's 100,000 cells per milliliter up to 300,000 cells per milliliter. And each dot is a measurement that's been conducted over this time series. And what this shows you, and if you didn't know, uh, the euphotic zone, the depth to which light penetrates in the ocean, it, this water is so blue at 175 meters, these organisms still see enough light to grow. So their abundance and distribution in the water column is they are crammed into this top 200 meters of the water column. And each, the width of these circles are how their abundance changes over a seasonal cycle. So they're highly uh, diverse. Their abundance is quite different over one point to another. You see they're widely distributed in top 100 meters. And then as the light shuts off, they start to die. So this is just one example of understanding this organism where they say, as I was say, if you look at their abundance, you could say, thank you for every third breath to this one Prochlorococcus. In addition to that heavy lifter of an organism, I will just show you for uh, nothing other than the appreciation of the beauty of these organisms, some images that I've been lucky enough to take over the years of staring through a microscope. So in addition to being small, abundant, and ubiquitous, I'd say they're absolutely beautiful. So here's our, go ahead. What is ubiquitous? Uh, they're everywhere. Huh? They're everywhere. Everywhere. These organisms, they're abundant more here than they are in a coastal environment, really? but they're, they're everywhere. These marine microorganisms are, like I said, we're looking at, if you count for viruses and cyanobacteria, hundreds of thousands to millions in a milliliter of seawater. Right? So think about the next time you swallow a little bit of seawater, how many organisms you killed. <laughs> yeah. So there's the green beasties that you've seen before. These are an example of organisms called coccolithophores. This is actually a plant that builds these calcite liths surrounding the organism's body. These are diatoms that have a silica shell. So they've actually got sort of hard parts. We don't necessarily know why they're so ornate. Like why do they have to have these particular shapes? Uh, this is a nitrogen fixing organism. And this is another variety of cyanobacteria. So they're quite different in their sizes, different in their morphologies, different in their colors, and different in their functions. This is the most abundant heterotroph on our planet. So this does not use energy from the sun to create new biomass, but uses organic matter to create new biomass in the same way that we do. This is an organism called Pelagibacter. Um, also quite interesting, little comma shaped. Nitrogen fixing organisms like pea plants, right? Where they can use, or air plants, where they can use N2 dissolved in seawater or in air to form their biomass. They don't need fixed forms of nitrogen like nitrate or nitrite, like most garden plants would. Again, this incredible beauty of these coccolithophores. And I'll just reiterate again that we do not know why they have the shapes and forms that they have. Why would you need to look like the little checks ball versus <laughs> this thing, right? Like, what is the difference in function between these two? There's still a lot of mysteries about the morphology of these organisms. Animals of all various colors. So mollusks, pteropods, things that swim and consume other organisms. This is from a single net tow um, at Station Aloha. So about 10 minutes of water of towing a net through the water. And we just happen to be upon a bloom of these organisms. I have a question. Yeah. If you took a sample of this particular population, what color would you predict the thing would look like we're looking at? This is white light. This is exactly staring through. This there's no fluorescence. This is their color. Yeah, I know, but if you poured that thing in a test tube and you looked at the color, 
like it just like that pinks and oranges okay. yeah yeah and there's there's a reason for that because red light actually attenuates very quickly in the water column the reason the light looks blue to us is because that's the light that's being scattered back to our eyes the other colors are absorbed right so for them to look red gives them a little bit of an advantage right and not seen very well but yeah these pinks and oranges are their natural color these are amphipods and i caught this little guy holding on to a bubble of water um, so uh, kind of like krill or shrimp they're swimming around the water filtering everything they can eating for their day in and day out or just bobbing around on bubbles Copa or isopods I have absolutely no idea why the little triumvirate was clutching onto one another but yes this is their ohana are those things also a micrometer no these these are actually quite large yeah yeah these are still quite large you can see these with the naked eye as well as these, this is my Picasso. This is a pterotrachea, it's a pelagic sea snail. This is a snail that lives in the ocean, right? A sea snail. Um, it's fairly translucent. And so those are, it's both of its eyes seen from the side because it's transparent. Um, bizarre and, and beautiful. So these organisms, they, they do perform very critical ecosystem functions. And I don't want to go through all these in detail, but just to remind you, this is the base of the food web. These are photosynthetic organisms that are sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. They're the base of the food web. They're oxygenating our atmosphere. And our oceans are changing. Um, I had a, a class where we asked students once to uh, come up with like a short line, like not just an elevator speech, but like maybe something you'd say in a bar, like what do you did, like why it was important. And uh, one student said, uh, the oceans are dying, the whales are crying, if you're drinking, I'm buying. <laughs> <laughs> I, we, you know, we didn't tell them to come up with pickup lines, but, um, <laughs> but it was, it always kind of made me laugh because there's, there's so much of oceanography that's a bit of a bummer, right? Because our ocean systems are changing. We're seeing warming of our planet that's changing the stratification of the upper water column. It's changing the circulation of our oceans. It's changing the production of our oceans. The more CO2 that's being sequestered into the ocean, we're seeing a change in the pH. It's becoming less basic. We're losing oxygen. Metabolism of oceans are changing. Biodiversity, particularly in coral systems, is being lost. We're seeing changes in the distribution and abundance of organisms. And in the coastal environments, we're seeing real and measurable erosion and pollution. And it's hard sometimes to stay positive when you spend your life studying these negative impacts of our grand planet. Again, what is Eutrophication? Eutrophication is the addition of nutrients, so a really high nutrient environment. Yeah, you remember back when it, when they had phosphate and detergents? Yeah. Yeah, and you'd see all these blooms and like pictures of like green lakes, oh. right? So that's like classic eutrophication. You've added so many nutrients that you get these massive blooms of organisms that are just sucking down all the available oxygen and forming these mats of organic material. Thank you. You're welcome. No, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah, I mean, and I appreciate you asking because, you know, we do this so long, we, we hear our own words. <laughs> yeah. All right. Does YouTube uh, have a positive meaning or negative meaning? It's fairly negative meaning. Yeah, I give it, a, yeah, it's bad. I have a question. On your um, acidification of the ocean, mm -hmm. Uh, how does that affect the local caucus? Local caucus. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to cover that in just a second. I'll show you a few images of this. Um, I'm a huge Annie Dillard fan. I don't know if any of you have read any of her work, Pilgrim at Tinker Creek. It's a great book if you haven't. Um, and I always think this is a really nice quote from her. And, and she wrote it in, in sort of taking time away from the world to really pay attention to the natural world around her. 
Um, and it's a fair quote. We, we do not live separately from the natural world. We are definitively a part of it. Um, we rely on it and we are changing it. And there may be consequences for the marine systems because of that. This is a plot of global carbon emissions. Um, these are data from 1990 um, to 2015 projected out to 2018. On the y-axis, the sort of axis here, is the mass of carbon that's being emitted by fossil fuels. So we're seeing a 1% increase in our emissions over each decade, uh, where you started in the 90s, around 20 gigatons of carbon being emitted. That gets ramped up. That's because there's more people on our planet. There's more production on our planet. There's more use of fossil fuels on our planet. And now we are on the sort of order of 40 gigatons of carbon being emitted from fossil fuels and cement alone. Um, that's about 10 petagrams a year. So a billion metric tons or say a billion elephants, sort of smallish, maybe medium-sized elephants where the carbon being added to our atmosphere every single year. You can ask the question, this has been a big question in oceanography and, and in uh, geosciences, where does that carbon go? We know we're emitting it, we can measure those emissions. Um, about one petagram comes out of deforestation, primarily the Amazon. As we're cutting down trees, we're releasing carbon and we're reducing the ability of those trees to sequester carbon. We're burning fossil fuels on land, so that's about seven or eight petagrams of carbon. So let's just sort of round that up to 10 for argument's sake. We can measure four petagrams increase per year in atmosphere. So the question has been, where does that carbon go? About half of the residual carbon ends up, again, back in land. So other forests and trees throughout the global terrestrial biosphere. The rest of it ends up in the ocean. And we wouldn't know this without the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series. Because if you want to talk about pre-essence, so people who had the forethought to set up a time series, Ralph Keeling would be the guy. So back in the 1957, at Mauna Loa, they started actually measuring CO2 concentrations. That's where they started, 1957. A little bit under 300 microatmospheres. The units don't mean anything. It was a number around 300. So you can see these sawtooth patterns, right? That's the seasonal cycle of our planet. The growing season in the Northern Hemisphere and then the time when we have net respiration, so consumption and production of CO2 that are driven by plants. And as we're emitting more and more carbon, as our population has increased now above 7 billion humans on this planet, we're seeing the lockstep increase of CO2 in the atmosphere. In 2013, we were at a little under 400. As of today, we're at 414 microatmospheres of CO2 in the atmosphere. We're producing more fossil fuels. There's more people on our planet. There's more carbon in the atmosphere. There's the data to show just that. These are Hawaii measurements. The Keeling curve, and this is busy, I apologize, um, but the Keeling curve is shown here in red. So that's exactly what I'd showed you, but from a shorter time period, now from 1990 to 2010. So we're seeing the seasonal cycle it's increase and decrease and locked on top of that, this sort of steady increase in carbon in the atmosphere. And the blue are in situ, so in water measurements of carbon in the ocean. And you can see it follows that exact same curve. And this is just simple thermodynamics. The more carbon you put in the atmosphere, you create a concentration gradient where things want to roll downhill. So you've got carbon moving from the atmosphere into the ocean. And part of that's just purely thermodynamics. Another part of it is these photosynthetic microbes that I love so much are consuming carbon. And out of the kindness of their little microbial hearts, they then die and sink to the seafloor, taking some of that carbon with them. The other consequence of increasing the CO2 in the atmosphere is it changes the pH. So here's the pH, and now you're seeing the decline in pH from the early 90s to 2010. And again, these are measurements from the Hawaiian Ocean time series. This gets termed ocean acidification 
but it's not acidic. It's just less basic. We're not like a boiling cauldron of acid out there. It's still perfectly safe to swim, but you're heading in the direction of pH 7, which is that switch between basic and, and acidic. So I, I would say, and, and this is fairly easy, that this is one of the grand achievements of the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series program is to document the change in carbon chemistry in the ocean. So welcome to the Anthropocene, all right? Science, society, and sustainability are intrinsically linked. And it's this larger context that matters. Yeah, That's Pleistocene, Holocene, Anthropocene. On the geological cycle, we are mining phosphate out of the earth. We are adding it back to the oceans. We are burning carbon from fossil fuels, adding it to oceans. We're fundamentally changing the elemental cycles on this planet. Yeah, this is this is our time. And so we think about this, and and this is this is where I'll just I'll try to add a little hope into this, at least for the microbes, not necessarily for us. Um, this is a gradual change in their lives, right? These organisms live for a few days, divide, reproduce, their daughters move on from there. Um, this is a gradual changing of their environment. We do have, so here's you know that time, we're slowly increasing our CO2. There are some events like eutrophication, so huge pulses of nutrients to the coastal environment that are rapid. Um, and the biology has a chance to adapt to that. So those like massive genomes that I talked about before, they have the capacity to change and adapt to this new chemical world. The question is really, do we? Um, so there are variable physical forces at work. The challenges that we face are, these are long-term gradual changes. It's very difficult to predict how these ecosystems will change when we're talking about hundreds of years. This is much more than the political life cycle of you know, four to 10 years. These are long-term changes that are very difficult to predict. And it's also difficult to resolve trends and make cause-effect uh, connections, which is why time series are so important, because you can start to separate the noise from the signal. Um, and clearly, there are natural cycles. This is 30 years. This time series is 30 years. We have natural decadal cycles on our planet, and we're just now starting to see what those look like relative to potentially human-driven change. So I'd say that some of our major achievements at Station Aloha are a high-quality 30-year climatology of the physics, chemistry, biology, biogeochemistry of the upper ocean. And again, the Hahana website, um, since this is on YouTube, either that or Google hot ocean. If you just Google hot, you're going to get a very different set of <laughs> image responses than if you get hot ocean. Um, you can go and, and learn more about the program and some of the other findings. Um, I'll also just mention, I, I won't cover this much, but we've got a gene catalog where we've been looking at the genetic diversity of organisms as well as their genetic potential. So which genes do they transcribe? What is the metabolism like? Over 9 million unique protein coding genes. So in the sense that we have sequenced the human genome, that's a that's a simple task compared to sequencing the microbial genome of the ocean. And we're just now starting to, to accomplish that. So I want to move into technological innovation since that was the theme of this month. Um, this is a neat little cartoon from The Economist where they were talking about our, our new uh, robot colleagues, right? 20,000 colleagues under the sea of how we can use autonomous technology to sample the ocean without having to take a research vessel, which is about $40,000 a day to see, to better understand these systems. If you know anything uh, about genetics, the base pairs that form the human genome are adazine, uh, ATGC, right? And so these gliders are actually uh, measuring various properties of the upper ocean. So we send them out, program them, they dive up and down in the water column over the top 200 meters. They sample data. They then telemeter it to a satellite that sends it to our offices where we have routines that automatically plot what the properties of the surface ocean look like. So we can look at 
dissolved organic matter. We can look at the temperature of the water column. We can look at the oxygen concentration of the water column. And we can look at pigments that are associated with various plants. And this is just a one month period. So we're out there on our time series cruises for sort of four to five days, right? That's probably like the Instagram of science. We've just taken a couple of snapshots, right? Where this is maybe the vine or something, you know, more continuous where we get to have a better understanding of how these systems look like over longer periods in between when we're able to go out at sea. So these sort of robot technologies have been really powerful adaptations to allow us to fill in the gaps between these monthly cruises. So these are a little cartoon of the gliders. That's what they look like. Um, this is just a plot that's showing ocean metabolism. And I don't want to necessarily explain this, but uh, the above the sort of dashed line is saying you're net photosynthetic. We're acquiring carbon below the solid line. It's net heterotrophic it means you're respiring carbon. And this system is really on the edge. There's day-to-day -day variability between whether or not the system is producing carbon or consuming carbon. And it's hard to get a handle on that in a short four to five day cruise. So these gliders allow us to sort of piece together what metabolism looks like in a continuous record and see this sort of day-to-day -day shift and start to then better understand what's causing these day-to-day -day shifts, right? So what is your mood today? In addition to gliders, we've got these autonomous profiling floats. And this is the last float that we dropped off. Um, here is Station Aloha. This is where the float has gone since we dropped it off. The color of the contour is proportional to how long it's been out there. I'm pretty convinced it's spelling love. We'll see <laughs> if we get there. Um, or maybe it's the Laverne and Shirley. Uh, but anyway, it's been out for 200 days and contact collecting continuous profiles of the upper ocean over this time series. It's now at 2085 as of yesterday, 166.72, out by some tiny little atolls. It also is daily sending its data to a satellite that then gets telemetered to my laptop where we can start to look at these veils of particles. So here's time beginning August 2018 out to February 2019. And this is a contour of particle concentration with these sort of lighter areas being high particles, lower areas being low particle concentration. We were out there for the passage of Hurricane Lane, which mixed the water column, shocker, right? High winds turned over the water column, mixed things really well. We see these mesoscale uh, anticyclonic eddies, so little hurricanes of physics uh, whirling through these waters and sort of strong physical mixing. So these autonomous assets are, are really sort of the best colleagues you could ask for. Um, and they're, they're truly filling the gaps between what we can do at sea. And next I'll talk about sort of my favorite uh, new application. Um, we have these systems called imaging flow cytobots. And really what they are are lasers that will trigger on any particle that scatters light. And as soon as it has seen, like there's a particle that scattered light, it takes a picture. That's what you're seeing here. This is about two milliliters of seawater, all the different images in those two milliliters from these diatoms to these bizarre little dinoflagellates to all these sort of unnamed organisms here. And what we're able to do using very similar technology to the technology that recognizes your fingerprint on your iPhone or your smartphone is classify the organisms without having to look through a microscope. So you can build these sort of machine learning technologies that say, I know who that is. I know who that is. And then you have someone go and sort of check to look at their accuracy. And in that way, we're starting to build these sort of classifiers of who lives where when without ever having to look through a microscope. So this is a really exciting um, new technology. Again, if you go back and look at the YouTube, here's an even more difficult website that you'll never remember, but it's the Imaging Flow Cytobot data. And we upload after every cruise, all of the sort of mug shots of these organisms, as well as their names, species, and characteristics of these organisms. 
So in one single five milliliter snapshot of water, we get over 500 images. So over a single day, there's several thousand images. Over a single cruise, millions of images. So with that kind of data and building these machine learning approaches, we're really getting an unprecedented idea of the diversity of these organisms. So with that, I, I'll, I hopefully I, I convinced you that without time series, um, the field observations would be hidden in the invisible present. Without time series, without context, we wouldn't truly know how these open ocean systems are functioning and responding to change. And this was a, a quote by John Magnuson um, in the early 90s that really was a, a call to arms for carefully and repeatedly observing the upper ocean biogeochemistry. So I'd say that some of the challenges that we face are there's changing paradigms, um, there's changing methodologies, we're moving from looking under microscopes to using these sort of more complicated machine learning tools um, that presents challenges for personnel. Um, the mean state of the system is changing and we must persist, to quote someone, uh, the last few years. And I'd say, and this is from an um, article that uh, came out from the National American Academy of Microbiology, that it's very important to have these time series because the next step is to incorporate them in our models of how the global ocean ecosystem works, right? The most powerful impact on life is Earth's climate. That impact is made by some of our smallest inhabitants, microbes. And there's a huge gap between studying these systems, measuring their metabolism, and then being able to model their metabolism and project what will happen 20 years, 50 years, 100 years from now. Bridging that gap is probably one of the most uh, important challenges we as oceanographic scientists face in the next few decades. I'd say even though it's daunting, it's within reach. What is at stake? in doing so, in, in perpetuating these time series and moving towards models of, of ocean and chemistry is our conceptual understanding of the sea. This is our Earth's largest biome. Our better understanding of global productivity and ecosystem services. Our understanding of how oceans sequester climate and drive, sequester carbon and drive climate. And ultimately the habitability of our planet and human survival. So I'd say quite a bit. Four lessons we've learned, and I take this from my mentor, Dave Carl. Focus on basic science at the edge of the cutting edge of the discipline. Engage with the best and the brightest collaborators who are anxious to share ideas, expertise, and data. And that is a wonderful thing that we have here at the University of Hawaii. We do have some of the best and brightest individuals that love going to sea and digging into the data at hand. And basic science is discovery-based, as Louis Prestour proclaimed, but chance favors the prepared mind. So expect the unexpected. Another argument for time series, just keep going out there. Just keep making these measurements. And take, take risks. Don't be afraid to fail. Just don't fail too often, All right? So what will it take? It's access to the sea. And that's something that we are very engaged in continuing and perpetuating this program of observations where we're combining theory, experiments, modeling, and synthesis. So I, I wanna share a little bit about the outreach, like beyond the science, like the impact that this program has had. We've supported cruise participation for nearly a thousand people, right? Almost 30 years. It's about 177 participating scientists Many of them go to sea multiple times. So if you count the number of times those scientists have gone to sea, about 4,600 person equivalents. So that's just science. About 100 UH grad students have gone to sea. Again, many multiple at a time, so about 477 person equivalents. 67 teachers at sea, 93 person equivalents. It's 67 teachers that brought this science back to their classrooms. 157 volunteers, one's back here, 213 person equivalents, 388 non-Hawaii participants, national and international, 
for up to 700 person equivalents. All that said and done, that's near 6,500, close to 7,000 people that have gone to sea on these cruises with four of these individuals with 200 plus cruises and one that just made 100 in a row, right? Like that is dedication. That's dedication to go to sea 200 times. Like I've got 400 days at sea, right? These guys, he's like, I just did 100 in a row. <laughs> And then importantly, since 1998, the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series and the partner programs have brought $150 million to the state of Hawaii for ocean science uh, to educate the public and participating students. And that, that is quite a feat. And I will end with thanking you for your attention and thanking the Hawaiian Ocean Time Series team. This was Hot 300. And um, we don't always wear lays, but this was quite an event. And they're really the individuals that make this science happen. So thank you. I appreciate it. Any questions? We'll go on to the science Instead of going to see so often, mm -hmm. could you collect a lot of your data in real time, upload you know, some way? Yeah, we, we have a component of satellite data that we, we collect those in real time all the time. Um, the problem with that is they're all proxies, right? Satellites are fundamentally measuring one thing, and that's the reflectance of light at the top of the atmosphere. They're not going to tell us nutrient concentrations. They're not going to put a, a face to all these microorganisms I care about. They're incredibly important tools to contextualize our work, but they're just one set of tools. And plus, going to sea is actually really fun. It's really fun. I mean, the lights are off. The sky looks like nothing else, I promise you. The production of cement. Yeah, it's the production of cement also emits some carbon. It's a very small component of the total fossil fuel emissions. Okay. Yeah. And then is the acidification of the planet, oceans, and the equal, or are there some oceans that are much less? No, so this is an area where we don't have that upwelling, right? So now we're seeing carbon being sequestered into the surface environment. For example, on the West Coast, the physics there are actually bringing deep, old, you know, hundreds of thousands in some cases, carbon rich water to the surface. So the global conveyor belt, the way this works is the carbon is going to be sequestered in the surface ocean. It'll eventually sink, but on longer time scales, it'll just be reintroduced. So it's just kind of brushing it under the rug of the ocean right now. Mm -hmm. Things are happening at different locations. Are there uh, sister sites that are giving, that are doing monthly yeah. uh, sampling, like like you folks have been doing when you started yeah. it first? But have others around the world? Is it mostly northern hemisphere? Is it a good distribution? Yeah, that's a great question. So we do have a sister site, the Bermuda Atlantic Time Series bats. Um, they're making similar measurements at the same time scales. There's also a station, Station Papa, that's um, in the North Pacific sub, sub polar area that's um, the Canadian Coast Guard samples that quite frequently. There are moorings along the equator. There are sites in the Southern Ocean and there are other smaller coastal time series all around the globe. And there are efforts, international efforts to coordinate the time series sites to sort of inform models in, in this way where they're actually Going to base their model predictions on more hard data. Yeah, we're not alone, thankfully. Yes, sir. Do you have, um, on the activity of taking measurements, do you have any frequent repetitive measurements going beneath, below mm -hmm. 200 meters? Yep. We routinely sample the biology just in the top 200 meters, primarily because that's where photosynthetic organisms live. Um, but what's our deep cast? 4,500. 47, 4,700 meters. meters, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah, so it's it's a deep ocean. By the way, when we when we put that thing down, is it on a cable? Or? It is on a cable. Yeah, you don't want to stand underneath that cable. <laughs> Go for it. First of all, what did you go to school? Or what made you get interested in doing something like this? Um, so I'm from Alabama, which is a great place to leave. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, I really was a biology major, and I actually started out sort of building computer models, like circulation models. Got a little bit bored by that because you can create any solution you want and moved more into sort of observational um, biology and decided that oceanography would be something interesting. I did my PhD at Oregon State University um, and I stayed there. I was a associate professor there before I came here. What, what, what made you come here? Dave Carl, the guy who started this, like I said, he's, he's my science grandpa. So he's been trying to, to get us out here for a while. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say, in Hawaiian, your name is Keo Keo. Keo Keo. Right. Okay. Oh, Anela Keo Keo, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. The microbes that you described, um, especially the, the, the very small ones. Mm -hmm. Prochlorococcus. Are there any um, human medical uh, applications that are... Uh, are they like that? Yeah, there are whole institutes that are looking at some of the products of photosynthetic uh, organisms for medical applications. Um, there's not really one that I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, urchins are generally the ones that have been used for a lot of applications. And mm -hmm. um, But yes, absolutely. People are looking at marine byproducts for a whole range of, of medical sources. Chlorophyll A is obviously in all of your supplements. Um, some of the vitamins are also derived from phytoplankton as well. Yeah. What effect like do you see um, for the uh, microbial community as a consequence of ocean acidification? So these organisms that have shells, these shells are, are made of calcium carbonate. And so as we move towards a more um, acidic pH, they're unable to build those shells. The shells start to dissolve. So those sort of beauty ornate organisms now are no longer able to make a living. So they'll be the they'll be the losers in that scenario. There are other organisms that really thrive under those changes in pH. So like I was trying to point out, I, I think the system will change. There'll be a new mean state. They'll adapt to that um, th that new mean state, and calcifiers will lose, and maybe nitrogen fixers will win. Those are just sort of broad brush prediction, so. Barb? Yeah. yeah, I'm sort of trepidatious about it. I was asking this question. Um, microbes um, would include viruses. They do. I guess, even though technically they're, they're not alive, but they're getting something else. But um, I'm interested recently in the problem of Toxoplasma gondii, which is the parasite. Um, it's, it's not a virus. I don't know why I'm starting with that. It's a protozoal parasite mm -hmm. um, that infects any warm-blooded um, animal. Can, it can. Um, certainly problems in humans, um, pregnant females, and so forth. But, I'm really concerned about the infection in Hawaiian mum seals. And so I'm wondering if by any chance you would, you or some graduate student would ever analyze, you know, maybe st stored samples of the water taken at Station Aloha for Toxoplasma gondii. Or maybe at 60 nautical miles, it's really too far away to pick it up as a landing stone. Yeah, I'm not aware of any of those measurements. I mean, we certainly have a pretty diverse archive of stored material. So if that's something you want to explore, come find us and, and show us, tell us who makes those measurements and we'll give them some water. Yeah, <laughs> there's plenty of water in the sea.